How many watch it? You ever move that closer to this? I'm going to have to. There are a lot of people watch it during the week. Yeah, that? Yeah. Was there, was there heavy attendance last night? <laughs> <laughs> Not as heavy as usual. I'm sure totally kept a lot of people down. Uh, it's not really much. In previous years, it's been packed. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's standard room only stuff. I think it was over half. It was probably over half. half. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we're going to start. If you're watching online, uh, sorry we're late. We've had some technical difficulties, and so the picture today may not be as well as it has normally been, and we apologize for that. But uh, connecting to Facebook's given us a problem, so uh, we'll do the best we can. As I was mentioning before we started, uh, we will meet this week and next week. We will not meet the week of Christmas. We will not meet the week between Christmas and New Year. And we will not meet the first week of January, so we'll be back in this class. It would be the 10th of January that night uh, for Monday. And then what would that be? The 13th. 13th of January for the Thursday class. So that would probably wrap this class up on that week. Um, so that's as clear as mine. Uh, let's pray as we'll get started. God, we do thank you for all that you do for us. We thank you for today. We thank you for the blessings you give us. And God, we thank you for this class. We thank you for this building. And God, I pray that your Holy Spirit's with us today that as we go through this study, that you're guiding our discussion, guiding where we go, so that we're learning those things you want us to know. I thank you for your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. We are in Lesson 8 on page 10, beginning with the book of Colossians. The book of Colossians is another one of the prison epistles, and as you know about the book, well, I'm sure most of you have read Colossians, it's four chapters, 95 verses, 1,582 Greek words, I keep emphasizing that, those are only the Greek words, English, I have not a clue, because there's so many different translations you know, to tell you how many there are. Now, the author is not, not a whole lot of problem, it's Paul, starts out in Colossians 1.1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. And Timothy, our brother, many times in Paul's letters, he's with someone else and he includes their names in there. This is another example of Paul making sure that people who are reading these letters know he's an apostle. Many people followed after Paul, chased after Paul, gave Paul a hard time, arguing he shouldn't listen to him, he is an apostle, he didn't live with Jesus, he threw people in jail. Most of Paul's letters start out with some reference to him being an apostle, and some reference to why he is an apostle, and in this one it's by the will of God. So you people who are arguing with me, Paul is saying, you need to knock it off because it's God's will that I'm an apostle. Uh, he's got Timothy with him, uh, and so it's Paul. This again, one of the prison epistles from Rome. This is the time he's in jail at the end of Acts, which runs from about 61 to 63 A.D. Uh, most people put these letters at the early part of that prison stage, it can be anywhere between 61, 62, 63. Uh, we've just got 61 in there. Uh, nobody knows for sure exactly when that might have been. But this is one of the prison epistles, one of the other three. What are the other three prison epistles? What did we study last week? Philemon's one, Philemon's one of them. What are the other two? Not Thessalonians, Philippians. Philippians and Ephesians. Okay? Those four right there together. We go first and second Corinthians, Galatians and Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Those three run together, Philemon's way at the end. Why is Philemon at the end of Paul's letters? Instead of here with these other three, since they're all written about the same time. Because it's the the link. Right? Was it the link? Yeah, link. Philippians the shortest. Right. And so it's down there toward the end because it's shorter than all the others. Remember, the Bible's not chronological. When they put the canon together, it's based on length of the book. So you get all of Paul's letters, beginning in Romans, and then running through. And then Philemon's the shortest letter Paul writes, and so it gets stuck way down toward the end of his thing. But the others are Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon, all written about the same time. And if you remember last week, we mentioned that guy named Tychicus, who's carrying these letters back to wherever they're going back to. He's there in Rome with Paul, 
and he's going to deliver these things. It's written to the church at Colossae. Where is Colossae? Anybody know? It's close to Ephesians or Ephesus, close to all those seven letters of the, the book, the Revelation letters. It's in that general area, what we would call Western Turkey today. It didn't get a letter no, in, in Revelation like many of those others do, but it starts out to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. So it's a city about 100 miles east of Ephesus. It wasn't founded by Paul. Colossians founded by someone other than Paul. Remember, Paul goes on his missionary journey, found a lot of these churches through that area, but there's no reference in the Bible that he got there. Purpose is to safeguard against false teaching, We've already seen in almost all of Paul's books, and you will see in almost all of Paul's letters, he writes against false teaching. A lot of people coming after Paul, coming behind him, uh, misdirecting people's thoughts, misteaching the truth. The Jewish people especially came along after Paul and said, it's nice that you're a Christian, but now you got to do all the law of Moses stuff too. And so Paul, in almost every one of his letters, references, don't listen to those people who are telling you false things. Pay attention to what I'm telling you because there's a lot of error. Now, Paul writes in Colossians 2, 4, I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. You ever had somebody talk so fine that it just convinced you that it's true and you find out later it's just not right? There are a lot of smooth-talking people around. There still are, which is why you need to know the book, why you need to read the Bible. Don't ever take somebody's word for something just because they sound good just because they act like they know what they're talking about. Always read the book. Compare what they're saying with what the Bible says so that you won't be led astray by these fine-sounding arguments. Uh, the Colossian heresy is a mix of theological and philosophical distractions. Big Bible words. What's theological mean? Anybody know? Basically, study of God. It's something to do with God. It's God knowledge. Theo is the Greek, is the word for God. A logical is usually knowledge of, something like that. What is philosophical? Human wisdom. Yeah, pretty much right, Jay. It's the human wisdom. So these people have come in and they're taking Paul's teachings and others' teachings about God and they're combining it with the wisdom of the world. And so they're acting like, well, here's some good God stuff, but, you know, here's the worldly stuff, and they're meshing it together and coming up with all kinds of weird ideas, Paul is saying, uh, that we need to be careful with. One of the primary things Paul addresses in Colossae, as well as John does in the book of 1 John, is this Gnostic stuff. The Gnostics taught that there's a big divide between what's spiritual and what's physical. That as long as you mentally assist, assist or assent to God, you can do anything you want to. Live any way you want to, act any way you want to. It doesn't matter because your mind is with God and your body is lost in your way, so who cares? Uh, Paul makes it pretty clear that's not the case. In almost all of Paul's letters, there's ways to live, ways not to live, which wouldn't make any sense if you could live any way you wanted to. John addresses this a lot in the book of 1 John because the agnostic idea by the time he writes, much more developed, uh, much more of a problem with the church. Simple outline, just really a little simple outline that fits so many of Paul's letters. Doctrinal clarification for the first three chapters. How to practice. So that last one. Almost all of Paul's letters are divided that way. He spends the first part of the book talking about, here's some theology, here's the way you're supposed to live, here's what God did for you, here's what you need to know about Christ. And then he ends most of his books by saying, okay, now that you know this, how are we supposed to live? What are we supposed to do? Uh, and then again, because I'm the teacher, uh, I've gone through and picked out a lot of my favorite verses, but if you've got some, uh, let's hear them. Anybody got any? Anybody read through Colossians and pick some verses out? Since I don't hear anybody, let me give you mine, and maybe that'll uh, bring along some of your thoughts. Colossians 1.19, Paul says, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, him being Jesus. 
So God's fullness, all that God is, is in Jesus. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, for the things on earth, the things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Paul makes it pretty clear, Jesus is God. He's equal to God. He is the divinity come down to earth. And that through his death, we can have peace with God. 2.16 Paul says, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. We like to make up the rules, don't we? <laughs> uh, I, you know, we, we just can't seem to get along without having a bunch of lists of stuff you can and can't do. And I shared enough uh, the denomination I grew up in we had all kinds of rules. I was listening to David Jeremiah on the radio as I was driving over here this morning. He was talking about he had been raised in the same church I was. He said, I can remember having all these lists of things you couldn't do, things you had to do. And he called them, if I can remember, they're the five godless ones, the seven filthy ones, and the nine, I forget what he called it. He had three different words. He said, but there's these three lists, the, the horrible things you couldn't do, the things that you really shouldn't do because they were really nasty, and then this other list that you know, no good Christian would ever get caught doing those. And he made the point, which I think is powerful. He says, Christianity doesn't grow from the outside in. In other words, you can't live yourself into Christ. Christianity grows from the inside out. If you don't get your mindset right, if you don't get right with God, if you don't center your mind on where you're supposed to be, your life is never going to be what God wants it to be. But the converse of that, that you think just by doing things or not doing things, you can be right with God, is simply not true. You don't get your way to God by living or not living right. It all starts with the heart. And so a lot of people, Paul's writing to them, and he was always dealing with these idol issues and the pagan worship issues, whether we should eat meat offered to idols, whether you should be drinking certain items, whether you should celebrate certain days. And we're going to touch on that Sunday morning. A lot of people don't celebrate Christmas. There's a lot of Christians today who say you shouldn't celebrate Christmas. We don't know when Jesus was born. And it isn't in the Bible. There's no evidence early Christians celebrated Christmas, so we shouldn't celebrate Christmas either. That's fine if they want to think that. But Paul's comment is, you can think that if you want, but you don't go around condemning people that disagree with you. And if you do celebrate Christmas, you don't go around condemning people who don't. Paul says, it's up to you. And he makes this clear in a couple of his writings. Romans is another good one. Uh, you got some of these things that aren't salvation issues. You just need to come to your own conscience decision on what you think's right and what you think's wrong, and then live the best you can to agree with your conscience. But you can't judge others. But Paul makes it clear the Old Testament stuff, keeping certain days, eating certain foods, not eating certain foods, was a shadow of things to come. The Old Testament wasn't reality for the people of God. It was a shadow. It was leading up to it. So now the reality is found in Jesus Christ. So when people want to argue, should we obey the Old Testament rules today? You can say, no, Paul said in Colossians chapter 2, that's just a shadow of things to come. Those things don't matter because they're external. What matters is, am I in Christ Jesus or not? Am I living a life to please him, not just keeping a bunch of rules? Colossians 3.15, uh, this is one we should be hanging on to. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of one body you're called to peace and be thankful. There are a lot of Christians we know that aren't at peace. They're not at peace with God. They're not at peace with themselves. They're not at peace with others. Uh, Paul says, you know, Jesus said when he was on earth, remember, my peace I live with you. Not the world's peace. My peace. God will give us a peace that enables us to be at peace no matter what's going on around us. Enable, enables us to be at peace with each other. There's so many Christians that are just at odds with each other. They can't stand each other. They don't talk to each other. Uh, they're angry, you know, they're just not living the way we're supposed to. Paul says, wait a minute, we're all part of one body here. It's sort of like my gout-ridden foot over here thinking to the rest of my body, I don't want to be with you anymore. You know, or the rest of my body saying to that foot, I don't want you here anymore. You know, 
Paul says we're all part of one body. There's no way you can't live at peace if you're doing it in Christ. He wants us at peace with each other. And that's a challenge for a lot of Christian people. I and, like the city, the promise of the city kept to my also. Whatever you do, whatever the word of the God, do it all in the name of the Lord. Hey, someone brought that verse up Monday. What does that mean, do it all in the name of the Lord? And then he was saying, What does it mean? What does it mean? It means that you do it like you're doing it for the Lord. You bring him praise. Okay, all right. Do it in his, with his authority. Acting for him. Remember last week, we looked, I think it was last week, some of these weeks run together with me. Uh, Paul talked about how we are ambassadors for Christ. We are representing Jesus. Mm -hmm. Right. To do all in the name of the Lord, yeah, means to live in such a way that God's getting the glory. Right. You're living your life in such a way that he is the one directing your life. It's like if you're out in the world somewhere and some police officer says, stop, in the name of the law. Well, he's not referencing some specific law. He's just saying the law in general is what you're supposed to obey. And that's what Paul's really talking about when he says, do all in the name of the Lord. In other words, do what he's told you to do. Live the way he wants you to live. Ascend to what he wants you doing. Don't make up your own rules. Yeah, it's a great, great verse. It ends by, and be thankful, this one. Too bad more churches don't follow it. It's too bad all of us don't follow it. Yeah. No, but I mean, yeah. the church. Well, there are a lot of churches that make up their own rules. You know, I won't say Central Christian it never had its own rules. I do my best, and our leadership does their best. We try not to impose rules on people the Bible doesn't impose. You know, you study the Bible, we, we try to make it as easy as possible to be a child of God based on what the Bible says without running up a bunch of more rules that say you can't do this, can't do that, some of these other things. Uh, yeah, Christians, like I said, we like to make rules. We like to tell people what to do. But we need to be thankful that we're in Christ Jesus. Always be thankful for that. Colossians 3.23 says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you'll receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It's the Lord Christ you are serving. Paul in many of his books, talk about the slave-master relationship. A lot of people have taken that and moved it over to the employer-employee relationship. It doesn't quite work because these people were slaves. When we get to Philemon, we'll look at that here in just a second. But Paul's talking to these slaves, and he says, whatever you do when you're working, do it as though you're working for God. In other words, don't do it haphazardly. Don't do it you know, grudgingly, don't do it with complaining and grumbling. Whatever you're going to do, do it as though you're doing it for Jesus Christ. And certainly that works in the employer-employee relationship. you got a job someone's paying you to do. You do the best you can do to be the best employee you can be. As though Jesus Christ was your boss. And Paul in other passages will talk to the bosses and say to the owners and say, and by the way, you know that you've got a master above you that you've got to answer to as well. Uh, so act that way. We're serving Jesus Christ. Christians, whether we want to admit it or not, are serving Jesus Christ every day, 24-7. You don't get to say, I'm serving Jesus on Sunday morning, and the rest of the week is mine. Now, if you're a child of God, you're serving Jesus all the time. We need to be careful. Any other passages or thoughts on any of these? Chapter 3. Okay. It's, uh, this this uh, deals with me, what I've dealt with most of my life. It's set your minds on things above, not on the earthly things. Uh, of course, the way I was raised, things and possessions were, was my, were my idols. And then the other is uh, verse 8. But now you must rid yourself of all such things, such as anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. And that's all I saw from my father was anger and filthy talk. You know, and this is a, an evidence, this is where Paul's addressing that Gnostic idea that people thought, well, I'd be a Christian and talk any way I want to, live any way I want to. Paul's obviously saying it makes a difference the way you live. And there are certain things Christians shouldn't do because it doesn't give God glory. You're not serving God when you're angry at others, when you're talking terrible, when you're slamming people, when you're using dirty language. But if you set your mind on things that are above, on those things that are important, 
we'd have an easier time not doing the stuff we're not supposed to. I'm concerned that enough of us don't set our minds there often enough, and we just sort of coast along, and so it's easy for our minds to go off in the wrong direction because we're not focused on God like we're supposed to be. we got two good verses. Anybody else? Three good ones. Yeah, that's what he just gave us. Think, of, think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. You know, what's your mind centered on? What are you thinking about? You know, we do get awfully hung up on material stuff. And we do because that's what we see. That's what we're working for. We want to eat, all these kinds of things. We let the world control us instead of letting Christ control us. And so we're spending more of our time thinking about what's going on around us in the world then we are, what's Christ Jesus doing for me? Yeah. Others? Um, I would like to say, so then just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thank, uh, overflowing with thankfulness. Paul is one of the best writers when he talks about thankfulness. Almost every one of his books include somewhere in it several verses about be thankful. Be thankful for who you are. Be thankful for what God has done for you. How many of us go all day long without once thanking God that we're saved? Without once thanking God that we you know, Christ came from heaven and died for us. Without once thanking God that we have a home in heaven that live with forever. We have so much to be thankful for. Forget about all the material stuff, all the worldly stuff, which we all have a lot to be thankful for. Anyway, how many of us are thankful for the spiritual blessings God's giving us? You know, we need to spend more time doing that, but this verse really is powerful because it talks about living the way since you've accepted Christ, you need to continue to follow him. In other words, you can't make up your own rules. You can't follow your own desires. You can't do what you want to do. I like verse 7. My translation says, let your roots grow down into him. In other words, we're supposed to be maturing. We're supposed to be getting stronger. A tree you know, palm trees and some of those that grow in the sand, storms kind of blow them over like crazy because the root system isn't deep enough to keep them on the ground. You get a big old oak tree, even though sometimes it went stronger in there, but most of those big old trees, they send roots down a long, long way. If you've ever had, tried to cut one down and pull it out, uh, those stumps were a lot of work because the roots go so deep. That's what Paul's saying we're supposed to be doing. Sink your roots down into Jesus. So that you're so anchored in him when the storms of life come, they don't blow you over. Now, that's a great a great word image, you know, picture of how we're supposed to live as Christian people. We're supposed to be developing our faith. Don't be satisfied with just being a surface Christian. Just having a little bit of knowledge, having a little bit of faith. Let your faith grow and develop uh, so that you're able to live your life built on him. Because he goes on to say, then your faith will grow strong in the truth. If you're not developing it, if you're not studying, you're not praying, you're not thinking about what God's done for you, or your faith isn't going to develop very well. I like 4-7. Okay. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. It says, let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. And he did point, I, I'll, I've had that underlined for a long time, but it just... What that? What, That's verse six. When I went into yeah. prison, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know what to say to those to those guys, those lifers. And, and uh, but when that guy showed up on my porch, my porch about two and a half months ago, Bill, and uh, you know, thirty-eight years incarcerated and, and stuff, and when he said what you said to me, I never thought I'd make any kind of yeah. an impact. I did work for him, legal work for him, but he said, what you said encouraged me, and I, I just I just was blown away. You know, we, we should come across as being kind people, being gracious people, being patient people. When we talk with others, don't be haughty, don't be rude, don't be curt, don't be nasty. Be gentle, be kind, be gracious. Be loving. Be loving. Yeah, they're all wrapped up in that idea. Love that person. It's all wrapped up in doing to them the way you want them to do it to you. You don't want people talking to you that way. You don't like people being nasty to you. Well, be nice to them. Don't be nasty to them. Talk the way Christ would want you to talk. And always, I always, when I went into prison, I said, Lord, you better 
I mean, not do better. <laughs> please, <laughs> please put in my heart and mind what to say. I don't know what to say. Yeah, that's the James three passage. James yeah. one passage that says, "If you lack wisdom, ask of God, who gives it to you liberally." Anytime you've got a decision to make, before you make it, ask God for His wisdom, so that you make the decision based on His wisdom, not yours. When we let the world decide for us, most of the time we're going to be wrong. But you let God's wisdom decide for you, every time you'll be right. That's the challenge. Okay. And one last thing. Sure. I, 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 every time I went in, and I went in hundreds and hundreds of times to teach, uh, I never heard the doors lock. I never heard them slam. My mind was always focused on, Jay, you've got to say it, say it in the most simplest terms. And I said, the Holy Spirit, help me to make whatever I say simple and understandable to them. Well, you were better than me, Jay, because all the times I went into jail, I heard that door slam shut behind me, and heard that bolt snap, and I thought, i got to get out of here sooner or later. <laughs> and I hope whoever's got the key doesn't go home. Of course, I wasn't there to teach Jesus to people primarily. I was there to represent criminals that were in jail. But I didn't like that sound of having that door shut behind you and that date and that lock open. Because you knew you weren't getting out until they let you out. Yeah. We need to speak nicely. Okay, our next book's Philemon. This is the last of his prison epistles. It's one short little chapter. Again, that's why it's last. It's Paul's shortest book, 25 verses, 335 words. Uh, Paul again says, uh, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brothers. Timothy's still with him. They're in, in Rome, in prison, visiting with him. Remember, in this prison time, Paul's in a house. He's not in a jail, not in a prison, but he's under house arrest, almost like today we think of people getting an ankle bracelet and can come and go as they wish. Paul wasn't quite that free. But he was pretty free. He could have people in his home. He, they come and go, all kinds of stuff. Uh, so Timothy's there with him. He's a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He doesn't point out to the fact he's an apostle here because of who he's writing to, what the point of the letter is. He isn't trying to convince Philemon that he's an apostle. Philemon already knows it. He's got a better reason uh, to address Philemon, and that's why he comes up with that idea. And so it's Paul writing with Timothy. Again, one of the prison epistles, somewhere written around 61, 62, 63. Uh, the people he writes to is this guy, and what most scholars believe is his wife and son. So it's Lehman 1, 2, it's only one, but Lehman 2. To Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, also to Aphia, they think that may be his wife, who's our sister, and Archippus, who they think may be his child. Our fellow soldier and of the church that meets in your home. They had a house church. They had a group of Christians that met in their house, and that was their primary place to worship. So that's who he's writing to, to this guy named Philemon, uh, to let him know some things he needed to know. Philemon is one of Paul's converts. He, he makes that clear in the book. He says, I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. Remember we talked before when we looked at the beginning of the epistles, the people doing the rough recording it isn't always the person doing the writing. So Paul's writing this one himself. This is a very personal letter to someone that he's very concerned with. Tychicus isn't recording this. One of those other guys isn't recording this. Paul's writing this. And he says, I'll pay it back. Not to mention you owe me your very self. Who knows the story of Philemon? Anybody? He's a slave owner. Okay, he's a slave owner. And one escaped on almost Onesimus. 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 Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, you're right. Paul's right. Philemon, the slave owner, Onesimus, who gets mentioned in the book, runs away. And presumably, from what Paul writes, might have stolen some stuff when he left. So Paul's saying, whatever it is, whatever he owes you, whatever he's done, I'll pay it back. But he goes to Rome, Onesimus does, runs into Paul somehow ends up becoming a Christian, and so Paul's sending him back with Tychicus. They're headed back to Colossae, because that's where Onesimus should be. You can't break the law, and if Onesimus is running off, the law says you got to go back. And so Paul's sending Onesimus back to Philemon, back to his slave owner as a runaway slave. And Paul in the letter says, you know, if he owes you anything, I'll pay it back, 
by the way, I'm not going to mention you know, leave your life. Mm. You know, in other words, you know, don't 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 take care of this because you're a nice guy. I'm just reminding you, uh, you owe me everything. Uh, sort of like uh, you know, who do you think you are? Trying to say no. Uh, he he done a lot of psychological work in this letter. Uh, again, he's a previous owner of Ornesilus, and he writes in verse 10, I appeal to you on my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. So Onesimus becomes a child of God while Paul's in prison. Onesimus runs off to Rome, probably figured if I get to Rome I can hide. It's a huge city. Uh, no one will ever find me there. Well, he found Jesus, and now he gets to go back to where his master is. So he sends him back as a, as a slave, also a brother of Christ. That is absolutely right. He's not free. He's Correct. still a slave, but he's going back as a brother. And so the purpose of writing is to have Philemon receive Onesimus back, not as a runaway slave, not as someone you're going to punish or potentially even execute for having run away and stolen stuff, uh, but because he's a child of God. Notice what he says in verses 15 and 16. When you're going through a tough time in life, and you're wondering what on earth is going on here, this may be the answer. Paul says, perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave as a dear brother. He's very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. Paul says, look, Onesimus ran away, that breaks the law, but maybe there was a reason that happened. Maybe God allowed that to happen. Maybe in God's plan it was to happen. So Onesimus would end up in Rome, find Paul, and become a child of God. Think about that for a second. That, that's the way Paul could spin this. That maybe the reason Onesimus ran away from you was so he could become a Christian. And now he's coming back. And you need to be thankful he's coming back. Not as your runaway slave, but as a brother in Jesus Christ. Paul never says, set him free. Paul never says, once he gets back there, you can't own him anymore. But he makes it clear to Philemon, he's not just a slave anymore. He's your brother in Christ. He's someone you need to pay real close attention to because you need to love on this guy. He's your brother. We don't know what happened to this story. There's nothing in the Bible, nothing even in tradition. That says what happened to Onesimus when he came home. We have no idea. But if Philemon was as indebted to Paul as Paul says he was, Philemon did what Paul asked and took him back, I'm sure. That's my thought anyway. Simple outline. He introduces him, you know, in typical introduction. He's thankful for all that Philemon's done. He makes some requests for Onesimus, and then he concludes with a typical type of conclusion. A couple of verses. Short little book, so it's not a whole lot. I like Philemon 4. It says, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. Wouldn't it be nice if whenever time someone thought about you, what they thought about was your love for God's people and your faith in Jesus Christ? If that was the first thing that came to their mind, when people thought about Bob Rose and the first thing they thought, you know, there's a Christian man who loves God. I doubt that that's the first thing most people think. But that's what Paul says, I always thank God as I remember you because of your love for the people and your faith in Jesus. We need to be doing that for each other. you got people in your life that's done something good for you faith-wise. You need to thank God for them, even if they're not here anymore. Even if they've already gone and left this earth. Thank God for them. Every one of us in this room got taught about Jesus by somebody. The last time you went to God and said, thank you for putting that person in my life. Thank you for letting these people who told me about Jesus cross my path. You know, I suspect most of us never think about that. You know, for me, it's my mom and dad. And I'm extremely thankful for my mom and dad. But a lot of people grow up in churches or in homes not going to church, not being related to Jesus, not having families that give a hoot about who Christ was. And for those people who become Christians, someone comes into their life and tells them about Jesus. We need to be thankful for that. We need to once in a while just say, God, thank you that so-and-so crossed my path. Thank you that I was taught about Jesus. Uh, that's just a pretty precious thing, it seems like to me. And then this one, one more thing, prepare a guest room for me, because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers 
not only does Paul lay out saying, you know, I'll pay for whatever Onesimus owes, not to mention you owe me everything, but then he ends it by saying, and by the way, when I get out of here, I'm coming over there. <laughs> you know, I read that verse sort of tongue in cheek, Paul saying, you don't do what I'm asking you to do, I'm coming over there and I'm going to find out. You're not going to get away with it if you don't do what I ask. I'm coming to see you. I think that was just a encouragement to Philemon. Persuasion. Yeah, yeah. Persuasion. Whatever. You know, just the idea that, of course, he thanks him for his prayers. You know, I'm going to be restored. Thank you for your prayers. But I'm coming. Give me a room ready. Uh, I'm coming over there. Paul is pretty sure he's going to get out this time. When we get to 2 Timothy, yeah, it's not the same mood. But in this prison, in this encampment, he, he's pretty well aware that he's probably not going to die uh, under that circumstance. But I like that one because he says, yeah, I'm just going to come back. You know, I'm going to come see you when I get out of here. Uh, which again to me means you better do what I'm asking you to do because you're not going to be able to hide it. I'm just going to show it's up. It's almost like the guy doesn't have the option to not do the problem. That is exactly right. I think that's what Paul's doing. He's telling them all this stuff. You know, I'll pay it back. Not to mention you owe me everything. And by the way, get me the room ready because I'm coming. Uh, yeah, I, I think he's letting Philemon know. I think because Paul understood in the Roman Empire, Philemon was in his right to execute an estimate when he came home. Paul. My Bible refers back to verse, uh, it's verse 6 2, referred back to Timothy 6 2. Uh, you know, 6 2 said that uh, basically if you've got a master, you're your slave, you've got a master, and he's kind to you, then you, you love him. and obey him, take care of him. Yeah. And what that you got me thinking about it in broad terms, that's Christ to be the master of us. The one to unleash us and you know, God takes care of us. Absolutely. He does it. Yeah. And, and notice he starts out this, I'm a prisoner of Christ. Mm-hmm. You know, he lays that scenario out there. Hey, you've got Onesimus who's a prisoner of yours, in essence your slave of yours. Well I'm a prisoner of Christ. I've got a master, by the way for him and you do too but now you've got a Christian brother in this fellow who used to be your slave. You need to treat him with brotherly love. But again, I think Paul does this because Paul knew the temptation would be to Philemon, not only just to Philemon, but to everybody who knew Philemon who owned slaves. You're going to let this guy get away with this? You're going to let Onesimus steal from you and run off and then come back on his own accord and do nothing to him? All that's going to do is get our slaves doing that. Our slaves are running away and think they'd get away with it. I don't think we understand the, the temperament of what was going on in Rome at this time and, and the pressure Philemon would have been under by everybody else in his community that owned a slave. You don't let slaves do this because it'll ruin us all. They'll all run away. And so I think that's one reason Paul pushes as hard as he does. Philemon is going to be between a rock and a hard place, wanting to do what's right and being faced by his community who said you need to just kill this guy at the very least chop his arm off you know for stealing from him he was in a tough spot with the world and again I think that's why Paul was just over emphasizing do what's right do what's right by the way I'm going to come but do what's right because he knew the pressure for Lehman was going to be under well in, in 23 and 24 his Ephraim my fellow prisoner gives Christ sends you greetings and then so do Mark and all these other people he has there's a whole list of people yes. that know what's going on. What's going on. Yeah. 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 Yes, not just Paul. Yeah, uh, a lot of other people who met Onesimus, knew who Onesimus was, but yeah, knew he was going back over there to uh, to Philemon. Yeah, absolutely. The key Paul. thing is the key thing is how, how that person treats you. I showed you a picture. You know, the slave in the United States, the black guy that his back had been you know been whipped and so on, had all those scars and so on. You know, that's not what what we're talking about here. That's not what the good thing you. You know, it's a, it's a, as a slave master for good to you, then you basically be kind to him, look, look at him type of thing. Well, and of course, as a Christian, you're supposed to be kind to everybody. Mm-hmm. You know, whether you're a slave or a master, you live the best life you can that gives God glory. Absolutely. Any other verses in Philemon? Like say, short little book, cute little story. Well, let me get out of this slide and we'll move on to the other one.
You've got another handout that I gave you. Everybody get one? Starting with Timothy. Timothy a little longer. That's why it's a little farther toward the front. Uh, six chapters, 113 verses, 1,591 words. The author, no surprise to us, is Paul. Uh, notice in this one how he defends his apostleship. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God, our Savior is Christ Jesus, our hope. Not just because I wanted to be, not just because it was an option I had. By the command of God, I'm an apostle, so you guys better be listening to what i got to say. Paul writes it. Again, no, there's no dispute to that. In the early church, everybody pretty well agreed it was Paul. The date, uh, this is sort of a, a litany of some things, some ideas people have. You've got all this written down in your notes. Uh, but most people suggest it was written after Paul gets out of, of jail, somewhere around 62 plus. Um, Paul's case gets heard there in the end of Acts. He gets released. So Paul, you know, he's telling Philemon, and I'm expecting to come back. One of the church fathers, Eusebius, agrees Paul got out of jail. He goes to Colossae. He then goes to Crete and Ephesus, runs into Titus, uh, writes some of those things. He ends up in Macedonia where he writes 1 Timothy. And then he wants to go to Spain. If you remember when we looked at Romans, the, his goal was, I want to go to Spain. And on my way to Spain, I'll stop by and see you in Rome. Um, he then comes back to Ephesus where a lot of people think he probably wrote Titus. Then he ends up back in Macedonia and the necropolis, according to Titus. Then he's arrested again and travels back to Rome, which is where he probably dies. He's imprisoned in Rome. When we get to 2 Timothy, we'll see some of the things he has to say as he writes that book. Uh, he's not under house arrest when he goes back to Rome this time. He's in a, a prison sentence. Some people wonder if maybe he's in this place called Mamertine Prison, which was a Roman block structure where they kept the worst of the worst people. Uh, it existed for many hundred years, according to one of the uh, websites I read about this place, but it's a Roman prison, the way we think about prisons. He's not under house arrest anymore. He's really in jail uh, when he goes back this last time. And then he was, he was martyred by being beheaded by Nero in about 65 AD. So he's writing these last few letters after he's been released at the end of Acts, but obviously before 65 AD, if he ends up getting beheaded by Nero, then all these other little letters that we're going to cover now, he's writing between that time. So most of the scholars suggest he probably wrote it about 63, soon after he got out of prison. But notice Timothy was there with him for a while, in prison with him, uh, from Macedonia. He gets out and travels. Timothy's the recipient. Timothy's from the city of Lystra, according to Acts 16. His mom's Jewish. His father's Greek, again, according to Acts 16. Created some problems for some of the Jewish Christians for a while. Uh, his Christian mom is Eunice. His grandmother's Lois. We get that out of 2 Timothy, uh, chapter 2. He goes with Paul on a second missionary journey. He's discipled by Paul. Paul makes it clear He's his brother, his son in Christ. He pastors the church in Ephesus. Uh, Timothy apparently was pretty powerful in that community. He's a young guy. Paul's often referenced him as a younger fellow. Whatever that means, we don't really know for sure. Maybe mid-20s or something. Uh, but that's a guess. Uh, but he's younger than a, a well mature adult. Um, but that's who Timothy is. He's the guy getting two letters. He gets first and second. Timothy, we go through these things. The reason for writing, uh, nothing's shocking about this, to combat bad doctrine. Uh, once again, the church is being led astray by people who are teaching false things, who are not teaching the gospel as it should be. He says in verse 3, I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer. you got somebody teaching the false doctrines, Paul says it's okay to tell them, stop. You don't have to put up with it. You don't have to live with it. You don't have to let them keep teaching the church. Somebody's teaching error. 
Somebody needs to shut them down. It needs to be the leadership in the church primarily. It's their responsibility. That's where Timothy is. He is one of the leaders in the church there. So Paul's saying, you need to stop these people. Don't let them teach error. It isn't okay to be nice and let people teach things that aren't true. That isn't being nice. Uh, that's allowing people to get away with things they shouldn't get away with. And then he wants Timothy to set the church in order. Obviously, false doctrine is one of those problems. Uh, but he says, although I hope to come to you soon, I'm writing these instructions so that if I'm delayed, you'll know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. So he sends Timothy there and says, you need to make sure this church is operating correctly. Get the church working well. By the time we get to Revelation, what was the problem with the Ephesus church, John? Do you remember? Out of worship. No. They left their first love. Yeah. So here's this powerful church. Paul spends at least three years there on one of his missionary journeys. And by the time we get to about 95 AD, 30 more years after this, they left their love for Jesus. They're doing things totally wrong. So Timothy, he may have corrected it for a while, but after he's gone, apparently the church just keeps headed down the wrong direction. Always a problem for churches. They're easy to be sidetracked, easy to be led astray by these people with fine sounding ideas uh, that sound nice but aren't right. Simple outline, again, it's not unlike many of the others. The combat bad doctrine, established church order. He warns Timothy you're going to be opposed by people who don't want you to shut them down. <coughs> Isn't that the truth? When you find somebody who's gone off in the wrong direction and somebody comes and tries to correct them, they get pretty adamant and they will fight you. Because they're losing their power. They're losing their control. So Paul wants Timothy to know, you do what I'm telling you to do, you're going to have some enemies. There are going to be some people who aren't going to follow you, aren't going to want to hear it. Uh, don't let them condemn you because of your youth, he says. You do what I'm telling you to do, but just know there's going to be people against you. He ends it by practical church living. And what are we supposed to do? Now that we know the truth, now that Timothy said it straight, what are you as a church supposed to do? Timothy is where we learn all about elders. And Paul talks about the church leadership, and we're not going to have a big class here on church leadership, but I think we understand, need to understand that if you're going to be a church leader, you've got certain qualifications you need to meet. Very few of these don't apply to everybody. In other words, we go through this list of what an elder is supposed to be. Almost all of us should be doing every one of these things except a couple but every one of us should be this. We should all have a clear conscience. Live your life so that you're not feeling guilty. But he needs to be a godly person. And he covered, you know, clear conscience, be above reproach. In other words, don't have people be able to say bad things about you that are true. People may always say bad things about you. But the challenge is, don't let them say bad things about you correctly. Be faithful in all things. Have a good reputation. Be respectable. Be dignified. Don't be a jerk. You know, be a godly person that people look at and see Christ Jesus living in you. You need to live a disciplined life. In other words, you can't be out, and that's the Gnostic idea. You can't just go do whatever you want to do. If you're a child of God, you need to act like a child of God. Be sober-minded. Be self-controlled. Have one wife. Don't be addicted to wine. Don't be a lover of money. Don't be violent. Have the kind of life people look at and they're glad to have you around them. You know, you make people feel good by simply being around. You're not a person that just rubs everybody wrong, leads them down the wrong path, does a bunch of crummy, stupid things. Live the way you're supposed to live. Uh, have a restrained mouth. We've already looked at that, uh, how we should talk. Don't be double-tongued. Don't be a slanderer. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Be honest with people you're dealing with. Uh, don't be quarrelsome. Uh, don't be always looking for a fight. Don't be arguing about stuff that don't matter. Don't be the kind of person that nobody wants to talk to you because there's always a fight. Uh, don't be quarrelsome. You don't have to have your way. And that's usually the people who are most quarrelsome or people who are demanding their way. And when they don't get it, they start arguing and screaming and hollering and going berserk. You need to have a good, godly home. Manage your home well. Be hospitable. Be the kind of person that people like to come to your house. They enjoy being with you. They, they feel good uh, being in your presence. Have a humble heart. Don't be proud. He said, be tested first. That's why an elder shouldn't be a kid who's just become a Christian. It needs to be someone 
who's lived a life and had been tested from time to time and, and risen through those things. Not a recent convert. Paul says not a recent convert because otherwise it might get haughty. It might get proudful. Their, their mind might think I'm more important than I really am. Um, challenge there, obviously. And, and I can remember, I think I, mean, I shared this somewhere along the way, my, my law partner was Mormon. And one day I was talking to him about the Mormon elders. And I don't know how much you guys know about Mormons, but they've got these young men that ride bicycles all over the place with an elder badge, or elders in the Mormon church. And they're the ones that go from door to door knocking and trying to set up Bible studies. And so I was talking to Jerry one day, and I said, Jerry, how can your young men be elders in the church when First Timothy clearly says that's not the way it's supposed to be, and the other passage is supposed to be the husband of a wife? I said, how do you justify having all these young men? He said, Bob, what are you talking about? So we went over and read First Timothy. And he read that and said, huh, that's an interesting question, Bob. He said, let me call somebody. So we called another lawyer in town who was the bishop for our community. And we had a speaker phone, and, and Wade answered the phone. There the guy. Um, Jerry said, Wade, I've got a problem. Bob and I are looking at 1 Timothy, and here's what this passage says. And we got all these young guys riding their bicycles. How do they qualify as elders? Wade said, Jerry, it can't mean that. Jerry said, Bob, it can't mean that. Click, <laughs> hung up the phone, that was the end of it. Wade had spoken. He was the bishop for the community that Jerry was under. Wade says it can't mean that. Jerry says it can't mean that. End of discussion. We never talked about it again because it can't mean that. That's a real problem uh, in churches. Uh, people who teach for themselves what they want it to be. But that was the answer. No discussion. No, let's look at the Greek. No, let's try to figure out what it, it just can't mean that. Okay, end of discussion. That was it. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to be a teacher. Doesn't mean you have to stand up here like this and lead a Bible class, but it means you need to be able to teach people about Jesus. You need to know the Word well enough to preach it or teach it to other people so they can become Christians as well. Able to teach or instruct. Okay? The problem is, it's been what you teach and instruct. A lot of people, like you said, a lot of people are different from reading that Bible. They well, that's why we need to be studying it. And if you're being taught by somebody, you need to be studying your Bible and making sure what they're saying is what the Bible says. That's why I challenge you when I'm from the pulpit so many times over and over. If I say something you disagree with, if what I'm teaching doesn't seem to fit with what the Bible says, challenge me. Come talk to me. I'm not going to get mad at you. I want to know the truth, too. And if I'm teaching something that's not right by error, I'll never teach you something that's not right intentionally. But if I've misunderstood something, you need to come tell me, Bob, I just said, doesn't mean that. <laughs> you know, don't just come and say it doesn't mean that. We're going to study it and figure out what it does mean. So don't come and say, well, Bob, what you said, it can't mean that. Well, what does it mean? Let's talk about it. A, a lot of times that comes about from different experiences that you've had. Absolutely. Sure it could mean, I, I've done this many times. I've read the Bible and it means this today. And then six months later I'm reading it, it means something different. Because mm -hmm. it's a it's the living word. Absolutely. And just because I don't agree with you today doesn't mean that you're wrong. Right. I can question that. Yes. But yeah. I don't come and say you're wrong. Right. I say yeah. But when I read this, this is what it meant to me. Yeah, that's the gentleness, respectful voice. You know, you don't come and say, Bob, you screwed that one up. You know, just come and say, how, how come you taught this? I'm reading it and I did this. In other words, we're going to talk about it. I'm not just going to let you tell me I'm wrong. You're going to have to show me why I'm wrong. And we're going to study it through to figure it out. But I always challenge you, challenge me. And if you're in another church somewhere later on in your life, and you've got a preacher or a Sunday school teacher or somebody teaching you something, and you read, listen to that thing, well, that isn't how I read this. Don't just go home and forget about it. Go challenge that person and say, why did you teach it like that? It's not the way I understand this. And then study it through. And maybe the guy's honestly mistaken. Maybe you're honestly mistaken. And you'll learn from that study. But if you just let it go, and the guy's wrong, then he's now taught everybody in your church or everybody in your class wrong. Never be afraid to have a Bible. And if you've got a teacher who says, you know, this is the way I teach it, and you don't like it, tough. You need to get rid of that guy. You need to find some way to get that guy out of that class. Because that's not the attitude Christ wants you to have if he's so arrogant. I think Debbie and I have shared before, uh, one of the men who used to go to church with us, whose name I won't mention, 
stood up one day in class and said, you know, I don't ever want to sit in the class with any of you people teaching me. He said, you can't teach me anything. He was a little arrogant, I would suggest. Yeah. He was so sure he knew the Bible so well that he didn't want to sit in anybody else's class. I told him, what do you think he's to learn from you? Don't be like that. I don't ever get that way. Always know you can learn. Like I was saying, what you may understand about the Bible today may not be the way you read it tomorrow because life changes you. Circumstances change. That same person always taught against divorce. Divorce was sinful. Divorce was horrible. It, was, it made you a second-class Christian. All these horrible things. And then his daughter got divorced. <laughs> Almost the very next week. It's, you know, sometimes divorce is okay and you need to be able to accept it. We need to be honest. That's not the kind of person you want teaching a Bible class, okay? Uh, so don't be afraid to challenge us who are up here teaching. Um, thoughts? Any questions about any of that? Favorite verses? Timothy's a big book. Got a lot of verses in it. We're not going to cover them all. Paul says, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Wait a minute, here's Paul, writing all these letters, writes half the epistles in the Bible, saying, I'm the worst sinner there was. Why would he say that? Because he persecuted. persecuted. Absolutely. He didn't just persecute the church, he went and arrested Christians who I'm absolutely certain were brought back to jail and executed. Yes. And he was approving that. He was okaying that under the Jewish authority. Uh, he said, I'm the worst thing there is. So if you're ever talking to somebody, you may say, you don't know how bad I've been. You don't know the things I've done. If I ever walk in that church, the roof would fall in. I've heard people say that. Mm -hmm. You need to remind them of this passage here in 1 Timothy. Paul went and arrested Christians, threw them in jail, ended up getting them executed. And yet Jesus Christ personally appeared to him and saved him. There aren't too many people out in the world today worse than that. That's why Paul says, I was the worst. But Jesus saved me. Christ came to this world to save us. Nobody is so bad they can't be saved mm -hmm. if they'll just accept Jesus Christ. He says, I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. We need to be praying more, church. You know, John had a great sermon a couple of years ago, or whenever it was, about prayer. We don't do enough of it. We need to be more in prayer. And then he says, for kings and those in authority, remember last week, Romans 13, same idea. Pray for those people in charge. Pray that they will be let us live peaceful, quiet lives. He's talking about Caesar. He's talking about the Roman government that was doing anything but letting them live peaceful and quiet lives. But he says, pray for them anyway. Remember last week in Romans 13, because there is nobody in power but that God's allowed them to be there. And you don't know what God's got plans for them. God this still loves them. Pardon? God still loves them. God still loves them. God would want them saved. Yeah. And so we need to be praying for them. We need to be asking God to reach those people. This is good, pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved. Flies in the face of the Calvinists who say God's already chosen those who are going to be saved and everybody else doesn't have a prayer. Paul says right here, God wants everybody to be saved. He hasn't already drawn the lottery and you're either in it or you're not. He wants everybody to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. There's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for many. For all people. Yeah. Every sin. Every. Yeah. Everybody. God wants everybody. That flies in the face of Calvinism also. That, that one does too. That's right. He gave himself for all people. <laughs> Not just those who God was saving. For all people. So if you're talking to a Calvinist who says, God's already picked who's going to be saved, and nothing you can do about it, you can't resist, it's that irresistible grace, you need to remind them of... of First Timothy. Paul totally destroys the idea of Calvinism in First Timothy. I like one nine which says, you know, you know basically if you uh, one nine that the law was made for people who are evil. That's correct. Made for Christian people, holy people. Paul's making it clear that if you're going to be a criminal, then you deserve to get punished. Mm -hmm. You break the law, the government has the right to punish you. Absolutely right. We as Christians should be obeying the law as long as it doesn't force us to disobey Jesus. We need to obey the law. Here's a trustworthy statement. Paul says, whoever aspires to an overseer, be an overseer, desires a noble work. Someone who wants to be an elder in God's church, they're desiring something great. A good work. A noble work. 
It should be something people want to do. Uh, too many times I'm afraid there's congregations that just go around and get people who to be elders because they succeeded well in business, because they're wealthy, because of whatever. They have no business being elders sometimes. Paul says, you know, you got a guy that wants to, he aspires to be an overseer, he desires a good work. He doesn't say just because you want to be one, you should be one. <clears throat> so he's already given us the list of qualifications. Actually, he's about to give us the list of qualifications and, and the order of things. But you need to desire it. If you're a person wanting to be an elder in God's church, you need to want to be. You need to be have a humble heart. Absolutely, you got to fit all those qualifications. You're not, you're not doing it for the glory. That's right. You're doing it for. That's really right. right. Not to lord over people, yeah. uh, not to be the boss, not to run the church, <laughs> but because you love people enough. I like this one when I see people stand out on the side of the road. Although this verse has nothing to do with them, anyone who does not provide for their own relatives, especially their own household, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Uh, another verse will say, "If a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat." In other words, there's no room for gold workers in God's church. Now, you're different if you're a widow, if you're an invalid, you can't work. That's what the church is there for, to help take care of you. But if you're an able-bodied person and you're just mooching off the church, Paul says you're worse than an unbeliever. You're just a deadbeat good for nothing. Don't put up with people like that. Make them get a job. I like this last one. Godliness with contentment is great gain. You know, if you can be a child of God and be content with what's going on in your life, you've got it all. You don't need another thing in this world. If you're right with God and content with your life, you're the happiest person on earth. Anybody else got some verses out of 1 Timothy? Anybody? What was the bad one in here? Where you at? Oh, I One uh, one uh, eleven. I don't know if I do eleven. Women should learn quietly and submissively. One day we're going to have a study on that and what that verse means. It does not mean women can't speak. No, nope, because if it meant that you couldn't sing, and everybody's commanded to sing. And many of the songs that we sing are teaching us stuff, right? The words of many songs are teaching songs. They're not just praising God's songs. They're teaching us stuff. Well, if women can't teach, and women are to keep silent, then they can't sing either. Nobody teaches that, that I know of. But they do take this verse way out of context and misuse it many, many, many times. Yeah. We've got to study on that. All right. Titus, moving right along. I want to get a couple more books in before we quit so we stay up with everybody else. Three chapters. 46 verses, 659 little words. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Once again, affirming who he is. He has the authority of God to be an apostle. Paul writes it, and some suggest probably written from Ephesus about 63 AD after he went to see Timothy. Um, Titus, though, is the, the recipient. Titus is not mentioned in the book of Acts at all. Not that that means anything, but he's in many, many, many of Paul's letters. And so not really sure you know, how some of that stuff happened, but we do know he's a Gentile, according to Galatians 2. He's a convert of Paul, like Timothy was. He goes with Paul and Barnabas to the Jerusalem Council, some people think. And he's Paul's messenger to Corinth, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Uh, a nice young fellow, Paul will call him his son in the faith, just like he does Timothy. Obviously loved this guy a lot. Somebody that meant a lot to him. Paul takes him to Crete. And when we studied the book of Titus on Wednesday night, several months back, Titus was left in Crete to set the church right, uh, to get some things done correctly. Uh, he sends some substitute people to bring Titus to Nicopolis later on. And so Titus meant a lot to him. Uh, must have been a fine young man purpose of writing is to set the church in order. What does that sound like? Just like Timothy, doesn't it? You know, get the church in order. The church is going berserk. Uh, Titus 1.5, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you may put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Uh, the church is not doing well early on. It's not doing well sometimes today. Uh, but it wasn't doing well then either. 
simple outline what are the leadership requirements. He goes through a list in order of what elders need to be as well. He instructs several groups how to live. Older women do this, older men do that, young men do this, young men do that. And then he ends it by you need to pursue good works. In other words, now that we know all this, now we're supposed to live. Favorite verses? Uh, again, I think I like this one. This is the reason he gave, like the lecture in Crete, uh, so that you might put in order what was left unfinished. Paul has given Timothy an assignment in the community in which he is in, that island, Crete's an island. He wants Timothy to, or Titus to go do these things as Paul's directed him to do. Verse 10, chapter 1 says, There are many rebellious people. These are people in the church that Paul is talking about. Full of meaningless talk and deception, especially those of the circumcision group. Remember, Paul's always being challenged by the Jews. They must be silent. Same thing he told Timothy. You need to shut these people up. Don't let people teach error and just sit back and ignore it. They must be silenced because they're disrupting whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach. And that for the sake of dishonest gain. They're getting either some money or power or prestige or something out of setting themselves up as teachers and doing the things. Then he says to Titus in the next chapter, you, however, compared to these guys that are teaching error, you need to teach what's appropriate to sound doctrine. Teach what's right. Teach the truth. He says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation, here it is again, to all people. Not just those chosen, not just some Calvinistic group, all people. But it teaches to say no to ungodliness and worldly passion. So again, he's addressing this Gnostic view that's permeating the church toward the end of the first century, that you can live any way you wanted to as long as you confess Jesus. He says, say no to ungodliness, worldly passions. Live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. He says, but avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. Here's a verse churches never, I say never, rarely follow. Warn a divisive person once, and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. <coughs> There's somebody in the church, and all they do is stir up trouble. All they do is create strife. All they do is pit one group against another. Paul says, tell them to stop. If they don't listen, tell them to stop one more time. And then if they don't listen, put them out. Have nothing to do with them. They are causing trouble. He says, you can be sure such people are warped and sinful. They're self-condemned. Paul doesn't mention the words here. You got somebody in the church that says, always causing trouble. Paul says you need to get them out. You need to not have them in your church. Because they're just going to cause more and more trouble. Anybody else? Any other verses from Titus? All right, one last book today, and then we'll call it quits. Second Timothy. Not quite as long as the first four chapters, 83 verses, 1238 words. Again, Paul writes it, and any question, no one questions that. Once again, he says, Paul, an apostle, by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus. Paul, always defending himself. I am an apostle. God made me an apostle. You people that are arguing against me need to shut up. Uh, he, so Paul, we agree, Paul writes that. Again, this is his last letter. Um, he's nearing his execution. Second Timothy is probably the saddest letter, in a sense, that you can read about Paul's life. Here's this guy who gave up everything in the world to be a Christian. He was a monkey muck in the Jewish council. He was a monkey muck in the Jewish world. He was going places. He gave every bit of that up to be a child of God and to walk the world telling people about Jesus. Thrown in prison, beaten, left for dead, all kinds of horrible things. He lists those things, I think it's in 1 Thessalonians, shipwreck, sorry, all these horrible things. Now he's in jail. He's about to be executed, all because he's a Christian. And he opens his heart a little bit to Timothy. 2 Timothy 4 says, I'm already being poured out of the drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus. That shouldn't be in there. Uh, 
wouldn't this be a nice way to live and be living on your deathbed and say, in all honesty, I'm ready to go. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. He goes on to say, henceforth is laid for me a crown of righteousness. And this should be every Christian's deathbed confession. I'm ready to go. I've done the best I could. I got to the end. I'm still faithful. So most people say he probably wrote it about 64 AD, certainly before 68, because he dies in 68. Timothy is the recipient. We know that from 1 Timothy, the royal purpose, to give Timothy his final words. He loved Timothy. I any question by reading through these things. Paul loved this young man. And he's looking forward to the church beyond him. In other words, he's letting Timothy know, I'm leaving, but the church is going to go on. I'm not the church. It's going to survive without me. But he's going to give him some final words. Real simple outline. Don't be ashamed of who you are. Don't be ashamed of being a Christian. Don't let people abuse you because of your faith. Instead, you need to be faithful to God. You need to love the scripture. You need to study it. You need to know it. And you need to preach the word. And for most of us, we need to teach the word. And Timothy's an evangelist. He's a preacher. So he's going to preach the word. But for the rest of us, uh, we need to be teaching others. Favorite verses? I love this one. For the Spirit of God does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Most translations say, for God did not give us a spirit of timidity. In other words, he didn't give us a spirit that makes us afraid. He didn't give us a spirit that makes us cower. He didn't give us a spirit where we step back and we're afraid to do anything. Paul says, we have a spirit that's power, love, and self-discipline. You want to do what God wants you to do, get up and do it. Don't be afraid. Don't let others silence you. I don't just sit back and think, I can't do this. Paul said, that's not the spirit we've got. We've got a spirit of power and love and self-discipline. And Paul goes on to say, if this gospel, meaning the gospel of Jesus Christ, I was appointed a herald, meaning I'm a teacher, someone who proclaims it, and an apostle and a teacher. That's why I'm suffering as I am. Yet this is no cause for shame, because I know whom I have believed, and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. What is the song? You think you know that song? <laughs> what have you entrusted to God until that day? My life. Yeah. More than your life. My soul. Your soul. That's what Paul knew he had entrusted to Jesus. And he said, I know good and well. He's able to guard that until that day. That day when I see him, that day when Christ comes to get his church, he has no doubt that my soul is safe. And yeah, that's a song. We sang that song all the time when I was a kid. Except the song goes, we are persuaded, right? Instead of the current word to dance, it's, I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed against that day. Our souls. We need to be as sure as we can be. We're going to heaven. We're going to be saved. God's going to protect and care for us. Here's something we should all take to heart. The things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. We need to be teaching other people so they can teach other people. So that those people can teach other people. It goes that way. Somewhere along the way there was a generation where nobody taught anybody. We wouldn't have any teachers left except you still read the word and get it. But the idea that the way God set his church up, there's teachers in it. There's men and women who are teaching other people to know about Jesus. And of course in these days there were no Bibles. Paul, Paul couldn't tell Timothy, oh, by the way, just go get that book and tell somebody to read it. There wasn't any book. You know, so Paul here is saying, you tell people so they can tell people who will tell people. We can still say that, but we've got the Bible. People are reading on their own. But we need to be, Christians still need to be teaching people about Jesus. Do your best to present yourself as to God as one approved. A worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Paul says, do the best you can to be approved by God. Do the best you can to live the way you're supposed to be. Don't be ashamed of who you are. Instead, you need to correctly handle God's word. Last one I've got is this one. All scripture is God read. Most of the old translations say all scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. God gives us the ability to do what God wants us to do. 
He wants you to do something. If he's given you an assignment, if he's got a good work that crosses your path, God will give you the ability to accomplish that work. Paul says in Ephesians, we are created in Christ Jesus to do good works. And God will give us the power. That's that spirit that we've got of love, power, and self-discipline. The trouble is the self-discipline part, many of us sit back and say, I don't want to do it. I'm too tired to do it. We don't have the discipline to do the good works God's given us to do. That does not mean everybody's got to do everything. The good works God's given Cheryl aren't necessarily the good works he's given me. But you need to be looking for the good works God puts in your life. And when you your mind says, you know, I need to do something about that. Nah, I need a Starbucks instead. That's probably the Holy Spirit reminding you, here's a good work for you to do. God's nudging you to say, here's something I've got in store for you. Go do this and don't be undisciplined and not do it. I think I, when I hear that scripture, sometimes I hear it, um, my feet putting on the brake <laughs> because it's the attitude of, well, if I'm being told what I need to do all the time, then it's not part of me wanting to do it. And there's something you know that we can say to that, I think, Deb, yeah, that there's a lot of people that are involved in good works. And God wants them doing those good works. But what we need to remember is not everybody's called to do the same good work. Absolutely. And I have no doubt if God is calling you to do the good work, there'll be a joy in it. You'll be blessed by doing it. You'll want to do it by the time you get moving forward. But yeah, sometimes we put those burdens on people and, and we make it such a chore to be a Christian that you're thinking, oh, come on. I've had enough. I'm tired. People get burned out because people they don't know how to out. say no. That's exactly right. You need to be able to say no. The Bible gives you permission to and say not, no. Now feel bad about it. And, don't feel feel bad. Bad. and not have the person you're saying no to say, well, why not? Don't you think this is a good work? <laughs> yeah, maybe it is for you. But that's not what God called me to do. And so we just need to be careful. We need to not use that excuse simply because you don't want to do it. But we do need to sometimes understand, just because I think there's some powerful thing to do, doesn't mean anybody else in the church needs to do it. God's telling me to do it. I can do it. He doesn't necessarily tell anybody else to do it. Uh, and sometimes we get caught up in thinking everything I come up with, all my ideas, of course today they're John's ideas. Every idea John comes up with, Everybody's got to jump on board and do it. That's just not true. You know, we need to let God answer those questions for us. And again, that's part of that self-discipline. Don't just sit back and say, I don't want to do that. Without first seeing if that's something God wants you to do or not. Because we put the brake on when we shouldn't put the brake on. But you're right. We don't all have to do everything. You need to be in prayer about it. We need to pray about it. But you need to listen to God. And you need to listen to that conscience. And if he's in there saying, you know, maybe I just need to go do this. We need not talk ourselves out of it because God may very well be asking you to go do that. Well, then that could be the devil coming in and Satan coming could in. Could very well be that. And saying, oh, you shouldn't do that. Could be that as well. Yeah. But, we need, but what we need to understand is if there's something God wants you to do, He'll not only give you the ability to do it, He'll give you the energy to do it. And you'll know. And you'll know. You'll get out of that tiredness. Yeah. Your feet won't hurt. Your back won't hurt because God will give you the power to go do it. You may fall completely apart when you're done, <laughs> but that's another problem. You know, but while you're doing it, God will give you the strength. I think you like working in ETS too. I've had a lot of work standing up there for five or six hours. But you know, every one of us survived it. You now, when we go home and put our feet up and think, I am praying. Three days. Three days. For three days. <laughs> yep. But while you're doing it, God gives you the strength and the power to do it because it's a good work. And what, Paul? Well, one three is a good statement uh, of what we've talked about before. About you know how people accept this thing. You know, if you look at thing four three, it says uh, for the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what they itching ears want to hear. Yep. Go read the next verse. They will not. Yeah, the lines there. They will turn their ears away from truth and turn away and turn aside from this. Yeah. There's a time, and here's Paul writing, you know, 63, 64, 65 AD. That's a time coming. Kind of people aren't going to listen. They're only going to listen to preachers who tickle their ears, people who make them feel good, people who tell them, y'all doing great, we're all going to heaven, let's go have a tea. Paul said, those times coming. 
and you need to be careful, and you need to not let that happen because these people will encourage people to do things wrong. Uh, they'll reject the truth. They'll chase after myths. In other words, chase after things that aren't true. Uh, there's a time coming for that. That time's coming and gone here. And there's people today in the name of Jesus preaching all kinds of garbage. That's why you got to know the book. I'm beginning to think the United States is like Israel. She must have got a sort of throne of somebody that wants to turn him away from God and give him a bad country this day and age. It could very well happen, Paul. Now, we're not, we're not the nation we used to be when it comes to following God. No question about that. Any other Second Timothy passages? That's a, like I said, if you haven't read Second Timothy in a while, go back and just.